Okay, so since we're streaming on Facebook too, um, we'll let people trickle in and just sort of like start off. So I think just the chill way to start this is uh, starting with you, Danielle, can you just sort of give a little bit of your background of what you do and like what got you interested in the higher ed space? Sure, absolutely. Thanks for having me today. Uh, yeah, I'm Danielle Strachman. I'm a co-founder and general partner of 1517 Fund. We have a, we're a pretty different venture fund. Um, we work with predominantly younger people who are uh, college dropouts or who have never been to school. And it's actually not bound to any age. It can be anyone who fits that narrative. Um, we've worked with some companies that people might know about like Loom and Luminar. And we are often the first check into a company. Uh, I came into venture in a very strange way. I am an educator uh, and an uh, old uh, school principal director. Uh, I came from the homeschooling communities and started building out a charter school based on that philosophy. And that sort of, that, that philosophy of teaching people and working with people as individuals has always been very pertinent to me. Uh, and it's not just about teaching, it's really just about how you treat human beings. And, and that is very much embedded in our fund. And so we think of each team that we work with as having individual needs and uh, support structures that we can provide for instead of it being, uh, we're not like an accelerator, we don't do batches and cohorts and things like that. Um, but it's, it's quite rare to find investors who come from the education world. Uh, I think sometimes people think that we might be an ed tech fund because I have an education background, but I always tell people I'm a really grumpy ed tech person. <laughs> um, so we are a generalist fund. We've invested in everything from apps to a quantum computing company. Um, and it's really that, that narrative of founders taking an atypical path by not having a degree that we focus on. Uh, and I haven't mentioned this yet, but uh, before this, I was on the founding team of the Teal Fellowship was there for the first five years in the beginning. And that's really what got us to start our fund is we saw some really amazing things coming out of that community of young people like uh, Vitalik launching Ethereum, Dylan Field launching Figma, um, Ritesh Agarwal launching oil rooms. And we said, at one point we were sort of scratching our heads and we thought, why are we sending this deal flow onto other investors when maybe we could step aside and start our own venture fund, kind of a fellowship 2.0 to work with not just individuals, but their companies. Uh, we pitched that to our old boss, Peter Thiel, five years ago. Um, not only did he say it was okay for us to leave our roles at the foundation, but he committed to us as an investor in our fund and that got us started. And that's the journey we're on. So I'll pause there. Uh, so yeah, Anthony, a little bit about your background before we dive in. Yeah. So I am managing editor at the James G. Martin Center for Academic Renewal, which is a higher ed think tank based down in Raleigh, North Carolina. Uh, I've been there for about two and a half years now, but we kind of, we cover North Carolina level issues and also national higher ed issues. So often we're writing and thinking about, you know, college costs, obviously, some student debt issues, um, university governance, uh, athletics reform, um, free speech and politicization on campus basically trying to keep an eye out for, you know, higher education, both, you know, public education and state provided education and also private schools. Um, so a lot, of, a, lot, a lot of our work is thinking, you know, how do we improve higher ed to center more effectively on students, on faculty and on the social benefits that higher ed can bring everybody. Great. Um... So yeah, just as a jumping off point, I think there are two questions that I think will communicate your sort of vision of what the future of higher ed is. So question one, if you, if you had an 18 year old, um, would you recommend they go to school next fall? And then two, if you had a 22 year old, would you recommend they get a PhD and pursue an academic career, um, given sort of the long term like state of how higher ed is going to look? Um, so yeah, let's just take it away, whoever, whoever wants to jump in first. Sure, I'll jump in. Um, I really think that everything comes down to opportunity costs. And so I'm not so black and white to say everyone should do this or everyone should do that. It's going to be very individual for each person. Um, you know, so you need to look at what is the cost of going to school? What is the benefit of going to school? Um, you know, if, if someone is, um, like I can use my, my own self as, a, as an example. When I was 18, I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do in my future. And my school was mostly paid for through grants and things like this. Um, and so 
that environment was a good one for me to sort of explore and learn what I wanted to do. But if I had been 18 and knew, hey, I really want to start X or I really want to work with X company, I think there would have been quicker ways to go about it. One way that I kind of liken what's happening today is I think about transportation a lot. And so, you know, at one point, we didn't have airplanes. It would be very hard to get across the country to be able to go somewhere. But as soon as you have an airplane, you can move much faster. And I feel the same way for young people now. When I was going to undergrad, four years didn't seem like that much time because what you could do in that time felt more limited. Like maybe I could go get a job somewhere. I don't know that I could have started a, a certainly not a scalable venture company. I could have maybe started a small business. Um, but the choices were more limited just because of the speed at which I could act. But now anybody with a laptop uh, can essentially start something that has scale to it and move very quickly, which means that those four years of school, I think inherently viscerally feels a lot longer because there's this paradox of choice of what you could be doing. So one of the things that I would say for an 18 year old who's trying to make this decision is what are the choices that are in front of you? Maybe you want to do a boot camp right now. Maybe you do want to go to school. Um, maybe you want to take classes somewhere uh, and enroll somewhere where it's cheaper and then apply somewhere else in the future once we get sort of past some of this, you know, new normal COVID uh, craziness as it is. Um, maybe you want to find an internship somewhere. Uh, I think there's lots of different choices that there are. So I, I would just say that it's very, very individual. And for a 22 year old entering the potential job market or thinking about going back to school, I think it's the same way. Um, and I think the, I think one of the issues, especially with PhD programs and things like this is that people think, oh, if I have an advanced degree, I will have a better chance of getting a job in the market. In some cases, that's true. But like, for example, if you want an academic inst uh, like position at an institution, they're so limited. And I think so many of us buy into that, oh, if I get a PhD in such and such, I'll be able to teach at this type of institution and do this. But those positions are so coveted and nobody really talks about that. So then when you come out of the, into the job market and you find, wow, I'm competing against a whole cohort of people I wasn't even thinking about, um, you can get in some pretty dangerous positions. So. So yeah, I would just say that it's very individual and each person needs to think about sort of those costs and benefits and how they want to maximize on the time that they have right now. And also to think really creatively about, you know, how can you spend some of this time that you're at home, not commuting places, um, learning more online and so on. Yeah, I think what's interesting is that especially on the sort of um, PhD track question, a lot of the schools that people you know, let's say you went to a top tier school to get your PhD program, a lot of even the second or third tier schools, it's not quite clear they're going to be there when you come out of the program. So if it was competitive beforehand, uh, yeah. um, that's sort of part of that. So Anthony, like, what do you think about these these things? Yeah, so I, I think Danielle, I, I don't think we have any big disagreements there, because it really is about what kind of, you know, student are you? What kind of person are you? And what are your choices? I mean, if it's, if you're looking at going to a pretty good school, but you're taking on 30, 40,000 in debt, you know, maybe pump the brakes on that. Um, especially if you're young and you have a very clear vision of what you want to do and there's a way to do it without college. I think that also kind of, you know, maybe you should take a risk on that. And even if it doesn't pan out, you can always go back to, you can go to college in a year or two and you're not necessarily overloading yourself with debt. Um, I, I think in terms of a PhD, I would, almost everybody highly recommend against doing it um, just for the fact that one I think after four years in college you need a break and you need to see what it's like in the non-academic world and whether you want to stick with it but also just how poorly the job market is for a lot of PhD disciplines because a PhD if your heart is set on becoming an academic and you are excelling in whatever field you're in you know a PhD can be a good chance but it's also if you know, if, if, if you can imagine doing anything else, then it's probably a good idea to avoid a PhD just in terms, I mean, just the long-term outcomes for a lot of PhD fields, they're not that great. And you're taking on a lot of, well, PhD, not necessarily, you're taking on a lot of debt, um, but it really depends on what kind of person you are and what you can tolerate or what you can't tolerate. Um, I, I think that's one of the bigger things too, you know, looking at it 
for an 18 year old, it's a very different calculus from going to graduate school. And I think it's much better to, you know, even adjust your plans a bit where if you're looking at 30, 40, $50,000 in debt as an undergrad, maybe look at some other school where you're only taking 10, 20,000. Because I mean, I have friends personally who are very handicapped by taking on a lot of debt for something that they could major in at all sorts of schools. Mm -hmm. And when it comes down to it, very few schools or very few types of jobs are really concerned about the prestige of the degree you get. I mean, so long as you have some credential and so long as you show some sort of growth and some sort of accomplishments, I think that counts for a lot more than the name on the diploma. Yeah, and I think uh, a helpful question is before COVID-19, so basically, let's say January, February 2020, I'm sure the two of you guys had some sort of like overarching thesis about the future of higher education, like whether that's more, more digital or the costs are too expensive, this or that, like what was that thesis and has what's played out over the two or three months um, since then and then looking forward sort of confirmed what you thought before or, is it, or has anything surprised you? So for myself, um, you know, I was on the founding team of the Teal Fellowship. We started that in 2010 and the whole premise there was this idea of what if you gave a young person, the Teal Fellowship still runs, they're taking applications for anyone listening and interested. Um, the whole idea there was instead of spending $100,000 on school, what if someone granted you $100,000 to work on a project of your choosing and you know how far could you get with that? And so we had this sense that you know, university education and actually to Anthony's point about PhD programs, uh, it really extends this like adolescent period. Like if you go into a PhD, you're lucky if you get out within four years, it's more like seven. So you get out of the school when you're 22 and then you spend another seven years in school, then you're like just almost 30 and you haven't ever had a real job or worked in the real world. Or I think there's something really um, impactful about sort of this real world concept because there's no teacher that's better than reality that has real incentives and you get feedback quickly and you know what you're doing. Um, if you're in an academic institution, you're really insulated from a lot of things. It's kind of like you're in a bubble, but you don't even know you're in the bubble until you exit the bubble later. And by the time you're almost 30 and you've exited a bubble and all your friends have figured that out and they have experience and maybe they've worked on projects, maybe they worked for other people, maybe they've had jobs. Um, they're coming out with a lot of expertise and wisdom that you have sort of yet to acquire. So with the fellowship, it was this whole idea of, can we give people real world experience really early? Can we let, and for the fellowship at the time, we were taking people who were 19 and under, they weren't even 20 years old. Um, and so those people got a real education in what is it like to start something? What is it like to build teams? What is it like when you, what you're working on doesn't work? What is it like when you maybe have the insulation from us of a grant and some cash, um, but you're going to learn really quickly about what people want, how people interact with you on that team side, like if your team breaks up or stays together, like all these things are very, um, very, very visceral. There isn't that isolation. I used to sometimes joke with Teal Fellows about like that sometimes the best learning is when you hit pavement and like, I can't throw a pillow under your head as you're hitting the pavement because like, you're not gonna get the lesson unless you hit it. Mm -hmm. um, and so with COVID and what's happening now, we're seeing this acceleration of that people are seeing, I, I think especially since colleges, as far as I have been able to see, and I'm sure Anthony has a lot more information on this, but I haven't seen any school try to set a precedent saying, hey, next semester, come to Zoom school. We're gonna take this much off the cost of you know, your class tuition, we're gonna make this more doable. No, instead it seems to be, let's keep the same price. You're really just paying for this piece of paper at the end that says that you went to this place as a signal. Um, but we're starting to see that those, those structures are breaking down. I think hiring institutions are actually where a lot is gonna change. Um, I'm not such a policy person, but more of an incentive structure person. And so when places are hiring and saying, hey, you know, we're not gonna use a college degree or I'm starting to hear about colleges admitting people without SATs this year because it's like, you can't really take the SAT right now or like the AP exam is open book this year. Um, 
these are all really different things that are forcing things to change. And so I think COVID is just accelerating things that I've wanted to see happen for a really, really long time. And it's scary. It's hard. Um, but I think it's, it's really important. And it's, people are, are looking at um, how they educate, how they think about their futures in a different way, because that certainty of what they thought it would look like is no longer there. Yeah, I think in terms of the effect of COVID, it's, accelerate, it's, it's accelerated some trends, but I don't think we've seen any super dramatic changes yet. Um, I think as the months go on, we could. And especially depending on how fall enrollment looks, I think that would be a big thing. Um, but yeah, I think we've seen, we, we've seen more cuts than you know, otherwise would happen, obviously. I mean, universities or the average university seems to be quick on cutting more adjuncts and getting rid of them. And then even some tenure track professors, um, some administrators are getting cut, though not as many as uh, adjuncts and uh, other professors, which makes sense because if, you know, the administrators are the ones making the budget decisions and you're going to be slower to cut, you know, your assistants or your department than you would, you know, professors. Um, something that slightly surprised me has been the cut of marginal sports programs, mm -hmm. um, especially at kind of mid-tier mid, mid schools like University of Akron has cut a few sports. East Carolina University has. Um, I saw about an hour ago Central Michigan announced they were getting rid of their uh, cross-country team, and they're at a minimum of uh, 16 sports, which is the minimum you need to stay in the FBS. Um, so a few of these have been a little surprising in terms of cuts they've made that universities have previously been avoiding doing or saying, you know, we, we just can't, this will alter the university. Um, you're seeing a bit more system-wide coordination of, you know, if we have a state system, how can we craft this downturn to survive? How do we make these cuts without completely gutting some schools? Um, some places that's stronger where, you know, in North Carolina, the UNC system is much more of a coherent system than state systems in you know, Ohio or other places. Uh, so I, I think in places with the large state system, you'll see more coordination. Um, but I think there's also a lot of these universities speaking to, you know, cutting discount for fall semester if they're going to be online. Uh, a lot of these universities haven't really changed their thinking on this, where they're thinking of what the universities need, where it's not just providing instruction to students, they're thinking we need this tuition money because we're reliant more on tuition than we are from state funding or donations. And that tu tuition pays for instruction, it, pay it pays for research, it pays for the fixed costs, you know, the buildings and everything else on campus, which is a fair point to make because that's what tuition does pay for. But that's not a great sell for students who have to do an entire semester online, and especially for students who had to dramatically shift to online after, you know, they go on spring break, then two weeks, it's everything has changed. Um, so I don't think there's been a shift in the minds of a lot of higher ed leaders of thinking, you know, this is not so much what we need to do, but we need to think about how we attract students and keep them coming back and keep them enrolled. Um, so I think it's going to take, frankly, bigger uh, budget cuts for a lot of these things to shift. Because right now, a lot of higher ed leaders seem to be thinking, you know, we're going to tread water. And then after we're through this, you know, state funding might come back up or revenue will return. We'll be able to get back to where we were. And uh, that's great if that's your goal and you're working in higher ed. But I'm not so sure students are really psyched about that idea, parents or even politicians at this point. So there's, I think there's going to be a, you know, a trade-off coming up. It's just what shape will this be and how drastic uh, will these budget cuts be or this loss of revenue to force colleges' hands? Yeah, Danielle, I'm glad you brought up uh, incentives and sort of the way that you sort of structure things. Because the thing, I, whenever I get in this argument with people about whether or not like the credential of college would still exist, I sort of think of, imagine you're a, as someone who has a lot of power at, at, a, at a firm as like an HR manager. Right. So like imagine, you know, you're an HR manager, like not a not at a tech company where there's like a cultural sort of like premium on not 
going to call like TO like there, there are things that the TO file is really a cultural thing there. But if you're an HR manager at a like normal firm in sort of like some random part of the country, it seems to me like the person who's managing that process is always just going to preference a college degree, just because like in a lot of what college is doing, they're they're it's a credential. You know, you know this person is socialized, you know this person can complete tasks, like there are some basic things. So if we're thinking of how the system could change, like how, how are ways that we could think about changing that like really sort of insignificant but quite significant sort of institutional thing that shifts things that way? Because um, if, if I'm an HR manager, I don't really, you know, at the end of the day, like I just don't really care about the broader argument about, you know, what colleges there is. And I just know this person has a degree and I'm going to sort of <laughs> get my points for passing people past the gate. How do we actually think about that? Yeah, I think, I mean, I think this is a really hard question because assessment is hard. It's inherently hard to assess people, um, to know what knowledge they know, to know what skills they have. And the way that I see things sort of going in the future is that like the, especially like the big companies, like they're, they get flooded with applications for jobs from different people. Um, from all kinds of very high-end schools and they still need to go and assess like okay of these hundreds or thousands of applications we have how do we sift through them and so I think there's a big question of how do hiring institutions crack the code of figuring out who is going to be sort of the best potential employee for them and like one idea that I've had is that there might be a merging in the future of sort of like boot camps and higher ed plus universities uh, sorry uh, boot camps and higher ed plus hiring institutions. So like, you know, if I'm Google and I want to start tracking talent for what I'm doing, I could put out some courses and see like, hey, how do, the, how do people that are like attracted to what we do here, maybe, you know, maybe the person feels like a Googler, like culturally, and they want to start engaging with us, what does that kind of look like? Uh, and how do we sort of track and assess where that person is over time instead of just saying, oh, hey, they went to Stanford down the street. This is going to be a good fit for us. Um, we are seeing, you know, we have been seeing for definitely at least the last five years, like some places are saying that they don't require the degree anymore, but I don't know how much that is lip service versus, uh, versus not, to be honest. Like, you know, I'm not in any of these institutions, so I can't say for sure. Um, but that assessment piece is tough, but I think also with what's happening with COVID is that people are going to have to start thinking about that because it's, you know, if you're, I don't know, finishing, if you're, if the next two years of your school looks like on and off online learning, then you're not necessarily assessing, you know, how does this mm -hmm. person work in groups or, um, you know, how, what enrichment activities are there on campus? It's like, no, there's not that. Like, it's like, yeah, sports are being cut school clubs are not going to exist as much and things like this. And so what is it, what is it really that the student is able to showcase? Is it just basically a glorified intelligence test? Like, um, and then when you get into things like, uh, yeah, when you, when you get into things, I mean, you get into like socioeconomic and like diversity issues and things like that when you start thinking about like, oh, this school is a proxy for some sort of intelligence. And um, it gets very difficult. But I, I do think that hiring institutions, the onus is on them to do really good work hiring. Like they have a large incentive to bring on the best workforce and whatever that looks like. Um, but the answer to like, how do they assess better, I think is a challenging one. Cause it is really easy to just like look at a LinkedIn or a resume and be like, oh, this person went to this place and we think this means something. But on the opposite side, I've talked to a lot of people who say that some of their best hires have been people who come out of community college and have sort of showcased things like grit and perseverance more than, you know, I don't know, intellectual raw horsepower. I just think, I think assessment is really, really hard. And that's what, like, the cracking the code on that, I think will start to break things down in higher ed, which then trickles all the way down into high school and so on. I, I think a lot of that is good. I think some of the things pushing against a big change in this is one, the legal hurdles, mm -hmm. um, because, you know, any sort of company, you know, issuing an IQ test or something like that has a lot of legal ramifications and they're, you know, absolutely a non-starter. Um, and college is a really convenient way to avoid that while screening at least for some level of assumed basic competency of even, you know, finishing the work you're going to do, following through, showing up on time. 
So that's a much easier screening process and it's free. Um, it's so outsourcing there, there's, it basically. What's that? It, you're outsourcing. It, 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 yeah. It's good yeah, for employees. Yeah. It outsources all the things about the legal implications. Yeah. So, you know, there's a large incentive for these hiring companies to get it right, but it also comes with large costs of designing your own, uh, your own screening process when you can just, you know, if you're getting 300 applications for every job, you can at least cut that down by half of your filtering for a college degree. You know, there, it's just a simpler way. So you don't have to wade through it. I, I think there's also, there's something similar going on there with when employer employers talk about a skills gap, even with college grads where, yeah, on the one hand, a lot of colleges don't seem like they're teaching some really marketable, useful economic job skills. Um, but on the other half, it's very convenient for an employer to complain about it because then they're not the ones who have to actually train new hires and mentor them on these things. It's much easier to just get the person who's ready to go from day one. Um, so it's, it's just difficult where, again, this comes back to what's the alternative? What are our other options? Um, I, I think actually the Trump administration has been putting more money into funding, you know, kind of apprenticeships and other not, not necessarily traditional four-year degrees. Um, and I think there is a role for that, but most of those have generally been in, you know, construction, manufacturing, um, union jobs, which have already been established. And it's not so much, you know, I, I think uh, enterprise has kind of done this as well, where they've done this sort of apprenticeship program of, you know, rather than waiting people to go four years through, through college, it, they get them immediately into their system and track them for middle management positions. And I think that's great, but I think it is telling that, it, you know, it takes a large national company to do this or, you know, uh, a German company like Siemens who has a similar program, but they've already been doing that in Germany. So they're just importing their model. Or I think Swiss companies have done the same thing in the U S so, you know, it, I think it, a lot of this comes down to until there's a cheap or much more effective uh, route than just relying on college degrees. Why wouldn't companies rely on this? Yeah. So something I'm interested in is we're sort of taking it as a given that online, you know, schooling, at least for the next year through Zoom, something like, is going to be mediocre. Um, and I think in 2013, you had a lot of sort of like excitement about MOOCs, right? Like uh, massively, I, I'm terrible with acronyms, but basically like Coursera, edX, all these sort of programs. So I think it's so weird that there was this, and maybe it's not weird and you guys can clarify this for me. There was a seven year head start where there's this model and, and, you know, schools like MIT and Harvard are part of these sort of programs. What sort of happened with online education during this sort of seven year period that wasn't sort of ready for this, despite how much attention things like Khan Academy, et cetera, got. Mm -hmm. What's the gap here? Right. So I think a lot of this is, there, there's been a few successes from this. I mean, Southern New Hampshire has a huge online presence, University of Phoenix, Liberty University's online uh, programs are huge. But I think that kind of shows why this didn't take off. Um, one is that, online courses are not really made for the average student, especially the average 18 to 22 year old. Um, one, because it takes the individual student to be more self-motivated than most students are, where you know, you're not showing up to a class, you're not necessarily hanging out with the students you're taking these classes with. So I think that's, and the flexibility also, it appeals to people who are either not in that traditional college age or who have you know, a family to support they already have a job, they need that flexibility, and they can't just take time off to do that traditional degree. Um, but I think more than anything else, it's not like in-person classes are always that high quality of a format for teaching and learning. The big benefit of in-person traditional uh, higher education is being on campus and being surrounded by other people who are on campus, who you can network with, who are you know, thinking toward the future, it comes from you know mentoring with your professors and networking and that kind of socialization effect of either you know if if like what i did i mean my first job came because i had a good relationship with an economics professor and that's what benefited me um, a lot of students will join a fraternity or sorority for the networking capabilities in that um, other students if they're really sharp and bright they want to be around other sharp and bright students and they'll be in an honors college or you know they'll be at the top of their class and there's some big benefits from that. And higher online education really can't substitute for that. Um, 
because I mean, you know, you, you can get the same credential, you get that college degree, but as much as students are paying for the credential, they're also paying to expand their network and they're paying for the consumption value of college of going and being around other young people and enjoying it. So I, I think that's why we're seeing, you know, online courses are great on the margins for a specific type of student and generally older. And I don't want to denigrate that because there's a lot of gains to be had there. Um, but it's a completely different value. It's a completely different question from the traditional in-person four-year degree. I agree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that sums it up really well, is that it's not just college is not about the learning. It's about the credential and that you get to wear the, you know, crimson shirt later. Um, I've actually often wondered what would happen. Like, what, what would happen if people just bought swag from other schools and just wore it? And just see like what happens to you like do you actually need the harvard degree or do you just need the t-shirt um because you know it's, it's pretty rare that someone wears the t-shirt and they didn't actually go there so you could get some interesting effect i think from that um but it is about that experience and and that network and opening things up um i do think that there are you know i think that there's like an unbundling that's happening with higher ed with things being online right now of okay how do people get that social piece? How do they network with people? Are there different ways to do it, you know, over Zoom right now? Um, I'm seeing a lot more young people going to industry conferences and things like that just because you can. Uh, and that opens up different worlds for, for them. You know, to Anthony's point about, hey, I knew the economics professor and that led to my first job. That is often how things happen is that you know someone who knows someone and then you get sort of, um, directed in a particular way. But I don't think that has to, I think that could look like any group that a person is part of. So I think one, one thing I would advise young people to do is to start expanding their professional networks by going, you know, going, if you will, <laughs> to group events, look for things that are online that are social, where, you know, you can start developing contacts in an area. Um, I also think there's some really interesting things happening right now that because people are doing more online, that like the, in, like my hunch is that sort of like the invitation is a little more open. Like now you don't have to fly to the conference, right? Like you can sort of, you know, jump on a Zoom, hear what people are talking about. I was on some online conferences the other day. My hack around this is I always just listen to the speakers and then email them afterwards. Like, oh, hey, I heard you speak and so-and-so. And then that leads to a conversation later. and. Um, especially, I, you know, I've built up my obvious uh, professional credentials at this point, but if I were 18 and I were doing it, I'd put that right in there. Hey, I loved hearing you speak. I'm 18 and I'm really interested in such and such. Like everybody, not everybody, lots of people love that kind of give back opportunity. Um, you know, so try to leverage that right now. Yeah, I was just going to add, I think that also makes some things clear where there's a lot of opportunities just because it's a weird time. And so people are going to be open to, you know, weird cold, cold emails and things like that. But I think that's also one of the problems with higher ed right now is that this is going to make things much more unequal, where if you're self-motivated, that's great and you can do this. But, you know, if you're a first generation college student yep. or if you're someone who, you know, your family doesn't have a lot of experience in these kinds of settings, where you don't know that you need to reach out, you need to be proactive, you need to brag about your accomplishments. That's really going to hurt because it's much harder for you to just luck into finding a mentor on college or finding a support group on campus. Um, so I, I, FAFSA renewals compared to a year ago are down 5%. So mm -hmm. I think when college, when classes are online and when they go back to campus, I think low income students, I think, you know, kind of the mar marginal students or middling students are going to be much more adversely affected by this. And this is going to be another problem, which for some of them, that's great in a weird way where they're not taking on debt and then dropping out. And then that debt drags, drags them down for the next five, 10, 20 years. But there, I think there's a decent number of students who would do great in a college setting. And now they're not going to get to do that. And it's unclear what good alternatives they will now have. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so before we sort of pivot to questions, I think the last sort of, and this gets to what you were just saying, uh, I'm interested a lot in sort of public school, like state school, public school, public private dynamic, because, mm -hmm. you know, let, let's go back 10 years ago, like you had the Great Recession, um, obviously, 2008, 2009. Um, and on paper, sort of moments like this, 
um, where people are losing jobs, the economies are is doing poorly, seems like, okay, great, like, don't go to a second tier private school that's going to charge you 60, go to your state school, because it's going to be cheaper. But something that happened in 2010 was you started seeing state legislatures like decrease funding for those institutions themselves. So how do you guys think, if you have any thoughts at all, how is the sort of like public school dynamic going to sort of, because like on the one hand, it could be a huge opportunity for these schools to provide a lot of value um, and play around with their models differently. Um, especially when you think of like, I think the frustrating we have a discussion is like we don't focus on a lot of people are actually commuter students. So it's not even, it's not as if like most people in this country are going to sort of like, you know, a, you know, traditional campus, like most of them are either like, you know, sort of like hybrid online, like with Phoenix, like you talked about, but they're also just commuter people. Um, so what, what do we think that sort of space is going to look like? Yeah, so I think this is important because about 75% of all college students go to a two year or four year public, public college. So this focus on these elite private schools is completely beside the point because it's going to look completely different. Um, I think, so th this is kind of interesting because generally in a downturn, community colleges benefit because they get more enrollment. Um, whereas this time around, it's not so clear whether they will. Um, I think with the health concerns, you'll probably see, you know, rather than paying, you know, $15,000 to do online education at a four-year school, I, I think you'll see more students looking to stay in state and looking to get their gen ed requirements down before transferring or doing something else. So community colleges might actually benefit from this. I, I don't think it's I don't think it's clear yet because we just don't know what fall enrollment will look like. Um, I, I think for your public colleges, it's going to be much more mixed. Um, I went to Ohio University, which has been getting some decent press the last couple of weeks for cutting a ton of uh, staff positions, uh, adjunct positions, and even some tenure track or regular faculty positions, um, and some administrators too, but not as many. Um, I think that's going to be the typical uh, effect for four-year mid-tier public colleges. Um, I think some of them might get hollowed out like Missouri Western State did last week where they cut their budget. I think 30%, they let about a quarter of their faculty go um, but you're going to, I think you're going to see, you know, general cuts and shrinkage for a lot of these schools and for schools that in other settings might be shut down. I think they're just going to be hollowed out because it's much harder to shut down a public college than it is a private one. Um, in Vermont, the state system, the uh, chancellor proposed, uh, closing three of the regional campuses and then there's an uproar and the, uh, board delayed voting on it. And then the chancellor withdrew the proposal and resigned um, from the political pressure, from you know the economic pressure of some of these towns. These colleges are the biggest employer in the town, if not the county. So I think, regardless of whether a, a college deserves to die, there's a lot more um, at play. Uh, especially, I think if Vermont can't do it, where Vermont has been for what five, six years now, seeing a lot of enrollment declines. They've seen five private schools shut down since 2016. If Vermont wow. can't shut down public colleges, I don't see how a lot of states are going to be able to do it. So I think you're going to see more hollowing out. Um, I think private schools are the ones that are going to be in the most trouble here. There's already been a couple campuses that have closed down. Um, I think we're going to see more of that. Pine Manor College in, Bo in uh, Massachusetts was just absorbed into Boston College, I think last week. So I think these uh, small private colleges that you know may have popped up between the end of the Civil War and World War I, who are heavily reliant on tuition payments and who are not really that well known outside their states, I think those are the ones under the biggest pressure, especially because a lot of these have already been struggling to pull in new students and to stop taking on debt. So I think public, public colleges are going to look different. They might get cut and hollowed out but private schools, when we're talking about closures, I think those are the ones that are going to get hit the most. I guess like there's certain things that I would hope would change and I don't know if Andrew yeah. has a light on this, but like, there's a couple of things where there are certain models that I think could really help students. And like one of the things that I think is, is often really sad about the college experience is that um, you're actually, you're, you're like getting like the educational piece of something, but not the experiential piece of something. And so there are a number of schools out there that sort of have co-op models and things like this, but I've always wanted more schools to go in that direction and ideally be beholden to, hey, 
when these students leave campus, especially students who might not have other options, who are unmotivated, who kind of, you know, need more support, being able to say, hey, I finished school and I have done three or four co-ops somewhere. I know that I want to do this field. I've got some experience in it. And now this leverages me into a job market in a time that um, is honestly frightening. Like, you know, we don't know exactly what things are going to look like over the next couple of years. So I guess I'd be really curious to hear from Anthony about, like, do you think that schools are going to be thinking more about the rate at which their students are hired, are, is that going to change? Or are they going to be like, oh, my hands are clean. We did the education part and oh, it's on them to go find that job. So I think we've already seen a bit of a shift on this in the last few years where, you know, students are being more mindful of how much debt they'll have to take out. So they're being a little more picky, um, which you've seen with a lot of schools, their, disc their tuition discount rates have been going up and up since about 2010. Um, so there's a little bit of pressure from students to do this. There's mm -hmm. also more political pressure of, you know, if the state is giving you 20, 30, 40% of your budget, mm -hmm. you know, and we need to see some actual positive student outcomes. Um, which, I mean, that was part of the motivation for um, the Obama era gainful employment rule that shut down a lot of private colleges. Um, but that rule also did not apply to public colleges. And if it would have, it would have wiped out a significant portion of them. Um, so I think already a lot of college leaders and college administrators are thinking on, along these lines because, you know, it's, it's good for their student, students if they can steer them into, you know, what are we doing well, how can we increase this, but it's also good for their own future and for general public goodwill of, you know, re whether we like it or not, the vast majority of students, their top reason for going to college is to get a good job. So if colleges you know, whether they want to be seen as, you know, these bastions for truth and advancing knowledge in society, or, you know, they, they don't want to look, you know, these just glorified vocational schools, mm -hmm. they need to be aware of what their students are wanting. So you're seeing more of a shift to that. Um, I think when it comes to staving off budget cuts from the state or keeping students coming, there's a very big incentive to say, you know, this is the data we have, this is what it seems you know, our students seem to be succeeding. Um, so the more they can see, the more they can promote that in their you know, materials, the better off they'll be in the future anyway. Um, and it, it, you know, it's also how much can we legitimately expect from colleges? You know, because if colleges are, have much more of an open admissions policy or much more open toward taking in marginal students, um, the more we pressure them for higher and higher graduation rates, higher and higher, you know, median salaries a couple years mm -hmm. out of uh, college, that could undercut a lot of students who could succeed, but they look like a risky gamble and colleges don't want the bad press from it. So it, it's kind of, I, I don't doubt colleges have been shifting this way in the last few years. And there's probably a little too much that the public expects from them. But for a long time, I think they've also, they haven't been concerned with it. And it's overall, I think it's better to have too much pressure on them in this area, mm -hmm. because I think, you know, students are uh, very attuned to this. And if they weren't thinking about it as much 10 years ago, they definitely are now. Mm -hmm. So the, the more that colleges can kind of realize, you know, the economic part of this is just as important as the academic part or, you know, Shaping, shaping students to be good citizens. I think that's going to benefit students and colleges in the long term. So before we go to Q&A, um, I just have a question for you, Danielle. So um, there's all these, we're agreeing there's this huge population of students who sort of are going to be open to alternate experiences sort of like the next year and sort of what the Teal Fellowship did um, and what 1517 does is, you know, try, and we talked about this on the sort of before we started the call, like, what do you, is, like, is there an opportunity in like sort of venture to sort of um, leverage those students and their experience as well? Um, is, like, and is there any sort of discussions about sort of a broader, a broader effort than just sort of like a specific program or a specific fund? Um, I mean, I think there's lots of opportunities. I feel very fortunate to be working with student demographics because I think there is a lot that we can do right now. Um, with 1517, we offer people $1,000 grants to get started on working on a project of their choosing, and it's non-dilutive. It's it is just a Venmo payment, uh, and so people will come to us, and we've done these grants over Zoom, and say, 
you know, hey, I have this thing I want to work on, you know, uh, we think of it as a learning experience, an opportunity for people. So we don't think of it as, um, we want it to have startup potential, but if it dies, like it's just a learning opportunity for all of us to learn about a particular industry or a piece of technology. So we've been doing that for a long time. But one thing that we've been toying with over the last week um, is something kind of like a Teal Fellowship model where maybe we would do something, you know, launch something in the next few weeks or month to say, hey, we'll give you and a you know small team of you, maybe three of you-ish, something like that, 50K to work on something for the next semester of your choosing um, full time and be able to see where that goes. Like if people are thinking about like, you know what, I, I have ideas that I really wanna work on. Um, you know, this is a, you know, this is for those students who, who have ideas like at the fellowship, we used to say some ideas just can't wait. Um, and, and for some students, they're really leveraging this time to say, hey, here's the things that I'm motivated on. Here's what I'm going to do. There's places like that. Um, you know, accelerator programs, I think, are going to be really interesting over the next year. Places like Techstars, um, Accelerprise, YC, all these different groups, because they're going to be doing online cohorts. And so now people who thought, oh, I, you know, I can't really get there. Or I don't think I could move to the place or whatever it is. Like, I think there's going to be more opportunities. So I would encourage people that if you have ideas to work on, look into different funding models, whether it's investment or whether it's different programs. Um, because we all are starting to think sort of outside the box of like, hey, what does this look like? How do we support, um, you know, this cohort of students who are not being as supported as they could be and are kind of scrambling um, like, you know, there's always this question of how do we step up to the plate on that. So I don't have a, we're, we are actually in the next couple of weeks, we're going to be launching a website that uh, my colleague Zach has been tremendous on putting together that um, is all grants. It's going to be all grants for different projects because we think non-dilutive is really, non-dilutive funding is really important early. And so we'll be launching that in a couple of weeks to help people figure out like, hey, here's some funding that I could use to get something started that I want to work on. And you could sort of, you know, craft your own project or internship, if you will. Great. So um, there's a open, there's a couple questions in the sort of the side bit, but there's also an open uh, question in the Q&A tab, sure. um, which it's a great question. So if you guys want to take a look at that um, um, and give your answer to John. Do you want to do you want to read it out a little bit? So yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll read it for people. I'm yeah. a professional who never finished a degree. I'm also the father of a high schooler who won a state gold medal in social studies. Um, but I but while simultaneously flunking history class, that's made me think a lot about the flaws of the traditional education system and whether and I've been waiting years for a Southwest Airlines of education moment where a low cost, low frills competitor comes in and disrupts the incumbents to provide the core benefits of higher ed about the expensive frills. What's holding that back? And are there any potential disruptors out there that you like or are watching closely? Um, and just to add something real quick to this, uh, I think what's interesting is I think what immediately comes to mind is sort of the federal government's role in this process, because the problem, part of the reason why there's less incentive for a low frills competitor is it's not as if people can't pay for college. You get your FAFSA, you get your loans paid for. So I think if we had a situation, and, and, and I realize this is a complicated issue, and Anthony, you could probably um, put some light on this. Um, it's not as simple as saying like, yeah, like if the government just didn't put money into the system, this would solve itself. But as long as there's immediate money that's available very easily for 18 year olds, it seems like there's gonna be a pretty high barrier to any sort of low cost thing. Um, so yeah, other than that, let's dive in. Yeah, on my, on my side, I would say looking into boot camps uh, is really, really helpful. I mean, most of the boot camps that are out there are, are tech or, you know, like coding design related. Um, I think those have, I mean, one thing that's nice about them is to sort of go back to my point earlier about time of like four years is a really long time for a young person right now. But if a boot camp is four months or six months or so on, um, you can learn quite a bit and move forward. I, I've known a number of students to go through places like Lambda School and it's, it's kicked their ass. Uh, and been really, really hard, but it's been a great experience for them to do something in a very truncated fashion um, and come out with real expertise on the other side. It's like any skill that you practice, you get to see yourself get better at it over time and you're able to start applying it. Um, so I would look into programs like that right now. You know, to, you're mentioning that you're, this person's mentioning that their high schoolers is really into social studies and things like that. And so I'd even sort of 
I wonder about side projects of like, can this person start like a blog or start writing? And I'm not saying they're going to like get a huge following or something like that. But my one of my core beliefs is that everything is built off of putting one foot in front of the other. Um, unless you have a rocket launcher behind you, like, and some of us have that and some of us don't, most of us don't. Um, but what are the small steps that your student can take to start doing the things that they're really enjoying doing? And I, I'll also put out there, I'd be happy to talk to your high schooler if you want to message me. Um, my email is just danielle at 1517fun.com. I like to say I give bad life advice um, okay. and, uh, and very happy to do it here. But yeah, that's, I, I would say look into to boot camps a lot. Yeah, I think one of the biggest uh, barriers that's holding a lot of this disruption back is sim simply legal hurdles and, you know, the, the accreditation process, which, you know, if, if you're not accredited, you can't issue the degrees. Um, I mean, there's been a few, I think with Lambda School, I think they bought into some form of accreditation so they wouldn't have to do the process themselves or something. So there's a few places trying to get around that. Um, Bob Luddy down in North Carolina, who's a very well-known um, entrepreneur there, he has, he has um, these uh, classical schools called the Thales Academy, and he just launched a small, um, I believe it's a liberal arts degree um, that's also, you know, low cost, low frills, just straight, you know, education. Um, so, I mean, there's a few things like that. There's also work colleges, which are typically very, you know, low frills, you work on campus doing something, they don't have any, you know, athletics or anything like that, and they give a good education. Um, so I, I think there, there's even a couple um, urban ones down in uh, one in Dallas. I, I'm blanking on the name right now, but um, uh, yeah, it'll, it'll come to me right when we stop this. Um, but I mean, there's there's about a dozen of those nationwide. There's uh, you know uh, Warren Wilson College down in uh, Kentucky, I believe, in Appalachia. Um, Berea College, another. It's all all for uh, no tuition college down in Kentucky. That's a really great example of this. So there, there's actually, there's a few out there, but they're not so well known. They give a good education, um, but I think a lot of schools, especially a lot of state schools are caught up in, you know, this higher education arms race or this growth mindset where we need to be doing everything all the time. And if we're not growing, then, you know, we're losing out to our competitors. And it, it's, I think it's one of those things where there haven't been many public colleges that have shifted to this idea of, you know, if we just strip this down and offer something decent, then we can still pull in a lot of students. Um, and also, I mean, a lot of good community colleges are basically a low cost, low frills competitor to the norm that's out there now. Um, you're not necessarily getting the on-campus experience, but you know, it's still, it's a community. Um, you know, the, the quality of, of schools can be a little more um, variable, especially by program. But if, if you can, you know, kind of dig into that, you know, there's, there's pros and there's cons to that route. But I yeah, think a lot, of, a lot of barriers to disruption are legal, but also social and what people expect an American college education to be. Because a lot of these low cost low frills, that's basically a degree in Germany or somewhere in Europe where they don't have a lot of these huge add-ons like we do, but it's a completely different experience from the norm in the U.S. One thing I'll talk about, out real quick, since community college was mentioned in this person as a high schooler, is community college is a great way to get involved with higher level classes than you might typically find in high school. And so, you know, mentioning like your student was failing out of the high school class, but competing and doing very well. Um, community college is a great way to engage in a higher level of learning. A lot of community college uh, teachers and professors love the act of actually teaching. Uh, and so you'll find some really good talent there. And so for anyone with a high schooler in particular, I would say, yeah, don't just think about what does the fall look like for the public or private school that they're enrolled in, but also think about enrolling in, you know, some elective community college classes, because I think the enrichment is going to be much better uh, in some cases than the typical high school class. Um, that's actually a perfect pivot to the, the next question from Sean, who I'm pretty sure is Lincoln's um, own Sean Roberts. Um, son's been accepted to three colleges, but he's considering junior college. What are, and you still guys sort of hinted at this before. What are your thoughts about postponing acceptances, um, going to community college, and then trying to transfer freshman college, um, freshman credits um, for next year rather than waiting to finish the entire degree? Yeah, so I think this really depends on what colleges you're talking about. 
um, because I mean, some states are very good about, uh, in North Carolina, they're called uh, articulation agreements where a community college verifies with um, like NC State or UNC or some other UNC school that, you know, the, these general uh, education requirements will fully transfer to our school when, when they move from community colleges to a UNC school. Um, some colleges and some states are really great about that. Uh, but the biggest problem with this idea of, you know, I'll do community college for a couple of years, get my basic requirements and go to a four year school. Um, one, sometimes those credits will not transfer at all. And so you're not really saving much time or money. Um, and two, the quality can be different. Um, which is why, you know, you kind of have to vet the community college and figure out, you know, how good this program actually is. Um, I think when you have an instance where, you know, the instructors are pretty good and they take it seriously, um, the program lines up nicely with what you want to do at a four-year, I think it's a great idea and it can save you money. I, I've known a few people who have gone that route and done it, but I think there is that concern of making sure that credits actually work for this school, um, but also making sure that, you're a student where you'll do it, but you'll actually finish this. So I, I know of other cases where people, you know, just drop out of community college or they might transfer but not finish the four-year degree. And so that turns a plan that looks very cheap into a plan that looks much more expensive. So I think specifically when everything lines up, I think it's a great route, um, but there are some trade-offs with that too. Yeah, and I think, um, so we've got two last questions here. Um, do we, need a, do we need a new accreditation system um, for future models of education that could move funding away from centralized institutions towards the accelerators and boot camps that we've spoken about earlier? Uh, yeah, but uh, that's much easier said than done. I mean, that, that's kind of the thing with accreditation reform, which we've written about a bit at the Martin Center. Um, there are some very good reasons for doing it. Um, especially because accreditation was not as much of an issue until um, the I believe the 1960s when it was required that to receive federal funding, colleges needed to be accredited, or maybe that was the 70s, I can't quite remember. Um, but that was kind of a big shift in the importance of accreditation where it became a roadblock to um, being verified as an educational institution and being able to get federal or student aid. Um, but the system we have now, there are some very strong, you know, vested interest in preserving the status quo. Uh, so I think we do need a new one, or at least something that's a much bigger uh, change in reform. It's very difficult to change the federal and state laws surrounding this. Big, you know, the, the top tier schools aren't really growing, it's sort of keeping the scarcity, mm -hmm. which gives sort of the prestige there. So can you just clarify what you mean by that? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I was, I wasn't so much thinking of prestigious schools as thinking of the average state school, which is, you know, expanding their, expanding their medical college or, you know, adding in a new department of whatever. Um, but I, I, so I think it's on the level of that. Um, the other level is that a lot of schools are constantly trying to grow. Um, and especially with construction and new buildings, which is a just constantly, you know, they're upgrading and replacing dorms. They're, you know, putting in a new administrative building. There's all these little things of this idea that, you know, we need nicer amenities to preserve our prestige and attract students, which students might appreciate, but not so much at those prices. Um, so I, I think colleges generally are, most of them are trying to always get more student numbers, but I think it's also this idea of mission creep and colleges that are trying to do too much. Great. So um, do you guys have any closing thoughts for everyone? Um, this has been really helpful. Um, thank you. I mean, I'm not in college anymore, so it's not that helpful. Um, but <laughs> I hope it's been helpful. Um, any closing thoughts? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think just in general, I'm more pessimistic about the possibility of reform even after the coronavirus and everything that's happened. Um, I think more than anything else, the biggest barrier is opportunity costs, where if you're an average student, then there's not a lot of you know, alternatives you could do to get your career started. I, I think if you're more self-motivated, if, if you're more at the top of your class, I think there's more opportunities for you. But until there's, until there's something big that changes that makes it easier for the average 18 year old or average 20 year old to get a good job and start on a good course in life, college is still gonna be what it is. I and mean, we're gonna see budget cuts and we're gonna see some changes but in terms of fundamental reforms, 
I would love to see a litany. Um, I mean, go on the Martin Center's website and see all the stuff we're talking about. Um, I don't think the status quo in higher ed is that great, but it's still for a lot of people, it offers a good value and a good start in life. And until something else pops up, that's going to be the norm and people are going to fight tooth and nail to keep the system as it is. I guess my closing thought would be that I think right now people are going to need to think really hard about the decisions they make, especially going into this next year, how much they're spending on school, how they're spending their time. Um, because you really don't want to come out of school in the next couple of years with even more debt in a down economy. Um, that, uh, yeah, that is just a bad, bad move. And so I would advise any parent or young person to really think about what could the next year look like and really brainstorm different ideas of, do I transfer somewhere else that's less expensive? Um, you know, is it possible to access more grants and loans and things like that? Is it uh, possible to do an internship remotely? Um, there's a company called Simba, S-Y-M-B-A, uh, that is helping people to find online internships and things like this. So I think, I think people just need to kind of broaden their idea about what they could be choosing over the next year, um, because the these choices are going to have a large effect over the person's next 10 years. Um, so I would just say be very, very conscientious right now. Great. Well, hey, um, great questions. Really glad for our participants. Um, and thank you to the panelists. It's been really, really helpful, I think, for people.